Hello, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Bruno Rost, and I'm a sustainability communication specialist working with Epson. So, welcome everyone to our round table today. It's engaging with young people in education for sustainability. Why did we choose this subject? Well, young people are rightly concerned about the future and want to know what businesses are doing about sustainability. At the same time, companies are looking to engage better with the younger generation, which of course is their future too. There are important learnings from both sides. This session looks at what responsible businesses can and are doing to improve engagement with young people to increase awareness and promote action on climate change. We discuss what companies are doing, what more can be done, and how businesses can work more effectively in partnership with educational institutions and NGOs to achieve these aims. Our session looks to draw on practical examples by both businesses and NGOs. We have four 10 minute presentations and then we will open up the floor to your questions and general discussion. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat window during the presentations. We will try to answer as many as possible in the discussion at the end. So, to introduce our lineup of speakers, we start with Leonie Sturck, Sustainability Manager Epson Europe. Epson is a global technology firm, perhaps best known for its consumer and industrial printers, but it's also the world's largest manufacturer of projectors and a leading producer of robots. It also develops augmented reality wearable solutions such as smart glasses. As a Japanese company, Epson claims to have sustainability at its core. It's, it aspires to be an indispensable company trusted throughout the world for its commitment to openness and sustainability. Leonie will talk about Epson's New Horizons sustainability project, which has to date engaged with over 11,000 young people. Next, we hear from Tor Morante, the communications coordinator for CEE Web for, Di for Biodiversity and the lead coordinator for its Game On project. More about that fascinating exercise in gamification very shortly, but Thor has worked for over 12 years in the environmental field in Latin America and Europe and has a background as a journalist. CEE Web is an NGO with a network of over 50 organizations operating across Central and Eastern Europe. It has over 25 years working for the conservation of biodiversity and changing the drivers behind its decline. So next up, we hear from another Japanese-owned company and household name, Toyota. Steve Hope is General Manager for Environmental Affairs and Corporate Citizenship at Toyota Motor Europe. Toyota Motor Corporation states that it's committed to initiatives that contribute to the harmonious and sustainable development of society and the earth through all its business activities based on its guiding principles. Toyota has developed corporate social responsibility strategies targeting environmental goals and today Steve will be talking about Toyota's extensive range of educational projects and how the company and subsidiaries have combined forces with a European-wide consortium of NGOs to promote biodiversity awareness and positive environmental action. And last, certainly not least, we hear from Bolaj Noj, an education specialist from the NGO Anthropolis. Anthropolis is a European NGO based in Budapest, Hungary, whose stated aims are promoting the values of cultural relativism, people empowerment and environmental awareness. With a focus on working with education and young people, Anthropolis has created a range of global education materials and programs encompassing climate action, cultural inclusion, fair trade, migration, gender equality, and contemporary slavery. So without any more further ado, it gives us great pleasure to introduce the first of our speakers, 
Leonie Sturt from Epson. Over to you, Leonie. Thank you, Bruno, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, like my colleague said in the beginning, um, sustainability is a really a key, a key element of our management philosophy. So for us, that means we are fully committed to the sustainable development goals and to promoting them and doing our bit to help achieve them. And um, Emma, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Um, so for us, that means that we have integrated the SDGs into all of our mid and long term plans. Um, they are our guiding principle or our compass, as we like to say. And uh, like, like you can see on this uh, collage, it's not just us as a company that is really committed to the SDGs, but all of our colleagues as well. Um, this is a collage that we did uh, in September this year for the Global Week to Act for SDGs, showing that all of us really are striving to do our part to make the world uh, more sustainable. And in addition to looking at how we as a company and how our products can be more sustainable, we also think that it is really important to raise awareness of sustainability and the SDGs outside of our organization. Um, one way we try to do that is by engaging with young people, um, in particular through our New Horizons program. Next slide, please. So what's the New Horizons program? Um, all of the different Epson offices all over Europe um, have been engaged in educational activities for a really long time. But what we did last year is to uh, create a big umbrella uh, to gather all of these different projects. And uh, we called it New Horizons. Um, we kept the scope of this program really broad. So any project with a goal of, uh, let's say, inspiring young people's creativity and increasing understanding and awareness of sustainability falls under that scope. Um, that means that there is no single focus area. Um, we really wanna be inclusive and cover all of the different aspects of sustainability, be it uh, environmental, social, ethical, or economical. And we also really wanna give our local branches the room and the opportunity to really take into account local conditions and to really focus on what is relevant for the uh, people in their region, which might be different in Italy than, let's say, in Sweden. And this also allows us to cover a really broad range of topics. We have climate action, energy efficiency, environmental protection, circularity, recycling, but also, and that's always really important to us at Epson, the social aspect of sustainability, which is often forgotten. So we're also talking about social issues, um, for example, like gender equality. Uh, our target was to reach 10,000 students in 2019 all over Europe, and we're covering all age groups. So from kindergarten through school to university. And most of our projects, we don't do by ourselves. We um, are realizing them in cooperation <coughs> with uh, NGOs and educational institutions. And it's really important to us to have strong partners in this. And um, just, one more thing that is also really um, crucial for us is that especially when we're speaking about older children and students, it is really important to us that we're not just teach to them or talk to them. We really want to engage in an open dialogue because um, young people have to say something and everything that we do as a company will affect more, their future more than ours. So we think it's really important to listen. But let's start with the younger children. Next slide, please. Um, our projects here in the kindergartens and primary schools are really aimed at hands-on lessons, very practical activities that reflect the everyday life of these children. Um, so just to give you three examples, um, in the UK, we have a card game that was developed. It's just a, a top trump game. You maybe know it like with dinosaurs or cars, but we do it with um, environmental lessons. Uh, you can see the cards on the right hand side on the presentation. Um, that's just a very fun way to teach children about different opportunities you have to, for example, save energy. And then uh, another project is from Spain. Those are the photos on the bottom. And they have a partnership with an NGO that is focused on biodiversity and the importance of uh, green spaces in schools. So what they do is uh, they created a series of posters which you can see on the photos, that were hung up all over these schoolyards um, to raise awareness with the students, the teachers, the parents, but also the local communities. 
And the second pillar of this project is teaching biodiversity through an actual trained biologist to the students for them to understand why biodiversity is so important. And finally, one more example from Germany. Um, there's a long-standing cooperation with an NGO that goes to schools and teaches environmental classes on, on different subjects. And you can see that in the photos on the left. And um, these classes are based on a learning by doing approach. So the children really get to get their hands dirty. Um, as you can see, one of the lessons was on paper recycling. So all the children really go through all of the steps of making their own paper you know, tearing it up, soaking it, and using a sieve to make the paper, uh, just to make them understand why recycling is important and not just for paper. At the secondary school level, which is on the next slide, uh, the approach and contents are obviously a little bit different. Um, in France, for example, we have a cooperation with an NGO called Revel, and what they do is they're really focused on promoting equal opportunities for children from, or from women and um, girls from underprivileged backgrounds. So what they're trying to do to them, or for them, is to show them what is possible in terms of the taking up a profession later. And what Epson does is uh, we offer insight, especially on careers in the IT sector, which is, as you all know, predominantly male. Uh, but we also organize workshops with them, for example, on how to prepare for an interview, always with a goal of showing them, giving them more confidence and showing them that maybe there's a career that they can dream about that they really hadn't had in mind yet. Uh, the Italian team takes a different approach. Um, last year, they were involved in a really interesting event, which was called the Social Innovation Campus. So what they did there, uh, it was a, an event for 800 students, an international event. And it was all focused on urban regeneration, technology, and sustainability. And uh, so what Epson did is we conducted workshops with the students to discuss the role of sustainability and technology and how those can interact. And finally, another very interesting example when we come to this part of we want to listen to the young generation uh, took place actually this September in Germany. There was a round table on the role of young people, politics and business uh, that featured local high school students, uh, the chair of the German Green Party and our European Sustainability Director. And it was really interesting to, to get their input on how, how they see business, what role they see for companies in, in achieving or in making the world more sustainable. And finally, on the university level, um, we focus um, on really close collaborations with the institutions themselves. So that means traditional programs like internships for people from engineering programs or from business classes, um, but, but also, let's say, getting directly involved in courses and seminars. Um, so this is a really interesting uh, example from Germany. Uh, there's a longstanding cooperation with um, the Faculty of Textile and Clothing Technology. And every year, this university runs a seminar on sustainable fashion. So what we do is uh, we help the students create their fashion collections. And uh, this is, for example, done by focusing only on sustainable um, textiles, for example, made from recycled PET, but also using sustainable production methods, like digital printing. And this is something that they can do at our solution center. Okay, um, for now, that should be enough. Um, as you can see on the next slide, uh, there are so many more projects I could be talking about. Um, but like I said in the beginning, our goal was to reach 10,000 students. And actually, Bruno already mentioned it, we reached over 11,000 people and with more than 30 projects. So a great success. We're very happy it went so well. Uh, so of course, we decided to make this more permanent. And then 2020 happened, which kind of uh, threw us off a little, because obviously it's really difficult right now to um, interact with really anyone, but especially with uh, students or people at university. So uh, we still think that it's really important to speak about sustainability, maybe even more important now. So we're looking at different ways of still being able to engage with people. 
But uh, yeah, we have some ideas about that, but maybe we can leave that for the discussion round. So thank you very much for your attention. And over to you, Tor. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Leonie. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to have this opportunity. My name is Tor Morante. I am the lead coordinator of the Game On project. And uh, I work for SeaWorld for Biodiversity. Before I jump into the Game On project, let me give you a very brief introduction of uh, SeaWorld for Biodiversity. The next slide. Uh, SeaWorld for Biodiversity. Uh, uh, is an NGO network of 53 organizations in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we've been working for over 25 years uh, for the conservation of biodiversity and mainly to change the drivers uh, behind uh, biodiversity's loss. We do so by uh, performing work uh, both in uh, the policy making arena and advocacy as well as through project implementation in the in the region, whether it is uh, through eco corridors, uh, with projects implementing uh, initiatives on climate change, on how to address it, sustainable tourism, etc. Uh, but obviously, we're here to talk a little bit more of uh, the Game On project. So, in the next slide, um, we will see the well. Welcome to to Game On. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Game On project uh, is a project funded by the Development Education and Awareness Raising uh, Program, uh, DEAR in short, and it comes from Europe Aid. Directly in a nutshell, it addresses climate change through a gamification approach to mainly uh, tackle uh, and engage uh, young people in the issue of climate change specifically. And where it has a, a bigger global scope, it obviously starts in eight countries from the region, namely Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Germany, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, and Slovakia. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, what is it? Uh, what is Game On about exactly? Uh, its aim is to activate uh, the global youth to react to to the threat that climate change represents uh, for the future of humankind. We are very aware of it, and uh, we know uh, what is up ahead regarding the, the challenges and uh, dangers if we don't do anything. Obviously, the climate change theme is uh, an extremely broad one. Therefore, the project has decided uh, to tackle three, three core areas, uh, which are the area of biodiversity conservation, the area of adaptation and mitigation, and climate justice. And among the several things that we're doing, how are we addressing uh, these, these items? First and foremost, by recruiting youth ambassadors who will help us and who are already helping us uh, replicate the, the messages uh, and share the activities we're doing. Uh, the activities themselves, uh, we're having a, a gamified approach uh, in order to have a, a distinct kind of engagement uh, with our target audience, which is uh, the youth. And the idea is obviously to raise awareness, uh, not only on the problems of climate change, but obviously on, on the potential solutions uh, that lie up ahead. And the, the ultimate goal in the end is to push for a massive mobilization uh, to demand for and make the changes uh, we need. So how do we do this? In the next slide, uh, we, I, let me introduce you to mainly our, our core activities and products uh, that are these gamified uh, activities. First and foremost, we are developing a mobile application uh, that uh, it is uh, about uh, trying to make sustainable livelihood in, in the users uh, via challenges, via awards, uh, and via different kind of activities. Um, we are also developing a board game that should be finalized by the end of the year. Um, 
we are we have now closed uh, contracts uh, with uh, comedians to develop stand-up comedy performances. Uh, in other countries, we will also be doing improvisation theaters. We have closed deals with a couple of museums already in Hungary uh, to overlayer their ongoing exhibitions, and these will be replicated in the other countries. The next slide, please. Uh, we are also developing an international geo-quest, a geo-catching geo challenge, uh, in order to have, uh, through riddles and treasure hands, uh, information and education and awareness raising for adventure lovers. We are obviously uh, also tackling uh, the connection with uh, wilderness through wilderness camps, inviting young people, and uh, so on and so forth uh, by festivals greeting through handbooks and guidelines and as well as more traditional approaches such as an e-learning platform uh, and educational materials for schools. Um, I wanted to uh, go a little bit deeper in two of our activities. Uh, so in the next slide, uh, let me introduce you to the board game. Um, why a board game? Um, well, board games can really push us uh, to tread carefully to strategize depending on how it is developed, uh, to learn and to thoughtfully and vibrantly maneuver ourselves to the ultimate goal, to win. In this case, uh, with an ultimate goal uh, uh, to, to, to win the battle against climate change. Uh, so we are about to finalize um, the, the first uh, draft, let's call it, of the board game. It is our partner in the Czech Republic who is developing it and it will be available in English and in the eight national languages of the partners. Uh, the target is for children and adults uh, above the, the age of 12 and while we will be producing a physical boards uh, to be distributed for promotional purposes, the board game will also be available in the end uh, to be downloaded and uh, to have it as an open source uh, distribution capacity. And in the next slide, I wanted to also introduce you to the International GeoQuest Challenge that we are developing. Um, Obviously, as uh, Leonie also mentioned, COVID happened and uh, we have been delayed a little bit to the capacity to to put it in place, but the idea is for next year to have it. Uh, in our, and this International Your Quest Challenge, uh, it allows for you to have an adventure showcasing the diverse effects of climate change and its links with our environment. Uh, considering climate change riddles uh, and the effect uh, of climate change on people, cities and ecosystems. Uh, we are targeting uh, over 100,000 uh, nature and adventure lovers. And this is for us, uh, we think, uh, an opportunity to link different pieces of a, of a very complex problem uh, by challenging people while putting them in, in outdoor scenarios. Uh, so to properly show the impact of climate change uh, in nature and in people, and thus enhancing the, the experience and the learning uh, itself. So that is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the project uh, Game On. Uh, obviously, in the round of questions, we can go a little bit uh, deeper on it. Uh, so thank you very much for this time. And now I give the stage to Steve. You're still on mute, Steve. Is that better? I can. You can hear me now. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tor, for your, your, your introduction. So I would like to uh, just give you an idea of what we're doing at Toyota in terms of engaging with young people and uh, biodiversity. Uh, just to uh, let you know that we are the uh, regional headquarters at Toyota Motor Europe based in Brussels, and we are supporting all of our sales and uh, marketing companies across uh, Europe, and we have 30 partners in that that uh, venture, shall we say. So um, can I have the next slide, please? 
So uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we've been very involved in over the past few years is the environment. So actually in 1962 was the first year that we had an environmental committee uh, within Toyota. And we've been working in this area ever since in this, uh, <clears throat> in this respect. In 2015, we decided that we needed to look forward to look, look at the long term and imagine what an ideal society would look like in 2050. And you can see that we ended up with six challenges uh, here. Three of them are related to climate change and CO2. One is related to water. One is related to recycling and uh, what we would call now within the European Union, the circular economy. And the more surprising one was the sixth one, which uh, for an automotive company, we often ask the question, why did we get involved in this? But it's to challenge a, 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 a society that works in harmony with nature. And from this point, we then developed some 2030 milestones. Please, next slide. So our main three, three uh, global themes within the uh, environmental area and harmony with nature are, are the first one, which is green wave. And this is to use our own real estate, the sites that we occupy in the factories and uh, distribution warehouses, the offices, dealers, etc., right across the world. Uh, how can we actually establish best practice of managing that land and the landscaping around it? And how do we connect with other nature corridors? We also have some long term programs with the today for tomorrow area. And this is where we develop global partnerships with some very large uh, NGOs, which were promoting global science and uh, projects in the biodiversity nature area, such as the International Union of Conservation for Nature, World Wildlife Fund, etc. Uh, the third area which I'd like to focus on today is to develop at some activity to promote uh, education in sustainable development. Next slide, please. So this is my own division's mission, and you can see here that we have a traditional Toyota house. This is the way we go about our business. So we're aiming to be uh, showing environmental leadership, and it's based upon some foundations and some pillars. The two pillars I would like to discuss today is our contribution to society and also education and awareness. We designed a, a thinking way, shall we say, of about how to promote this with our, our own members, but also that of the community that is to think to understand to act and then also then to share so next slide please So our responsibility, we've split up into a number of areas. So we've been working, as I mentioned, with our local sites and we've been working with the local community funds as well to try and uh, uh, promote our activities in the local area where we're operating. We've also tried to engage our own members in volunteer awareness. And one example is the World Cleanup Day, which takes place every September. And we actually encourage our members uh, to take part in a physical activity. The one I would like to work to, uh, mention to you today is the Toyota Fund for Europe. Please, next slide. So the Toyota Fund for Europe is designed that we have a centralized project and we try to uh, apply that across Europe. So actually what we did in this particular instance is we uh, worked with uh, uh, the Kew Royal Botanic Gardens in London uh, for some projects. But whilst we were having this conversation with Kew, we were able to understand that they had an education program. And the education program had only been applied in two countries. It had been applied in the UK and in South Africa. And actually, their current partners had no interest to try and uh, uh, replicate that material further. The material that they had was uh, to have certain age groups of training and uh, uh, to try and uh, engage with those different uh, schools and uh, these age ranges to take them through the various stages of being aware, looking out, uh, discoverer, thinkers. So following the same sort of strategy that we had. So this was existing material. But what we decided to do was work with another organization, the Foundation for Environmental Education, to replicate this in other countries countries with Q's uh, uh, assistance. So we actually translated the uh, materials and into other languages so that they could be applied by uh, the national operators of the fee organization. Next slide, please. Actually, this is what we managed to achieve. You can see that uh, we didn't manage to uh, uh, go completely across Europe, but we were able to go to 13 countries eventually. Next slide, please. 
Here is some examples of what we tried to do. So we tried to follow Toyota principles very strongly. And those principles were physically to uh, try and introduce the members to go outside, go and see. So we are ex you can see here that the children are uh, encouraged to go outside to observe and try to understand what they are looking at within their uh, area. We also then try to uh, engage those uh, those children through social media and through certain other activities that will allow them to show their interest and their passion. The aim is to uh, try and take children to be really advocates on behalf of the environment in the same way that advocates are often, they are, children are often advocates in the safety world. Often if you are driving your car, there's a voice coming from the back seat saying you're going too fast or you, you need to uh, uh, call your driving manner down, for example. This is the sort of thing that we wanted to try and encourage within students uh, in the environmental area. And we've seen it in certain areas, you know, children come home and often they're the experts in how to recycle things. Next slide, please. How did we manage to achieve? So at the end of a five-year program, we had managed to enter 13 countries, had uh, 5,790 teachers involved at over 743 schools in 13 countries. So we ended up with around <coughs> uh, 75,000 uh, students actually being involved in the program. And you can see there underneath, there's a, an evolution of that project as we, as we went uh, further through. So we believe we've been relatively secure successful with this particular project. So next slide please. So we had some project successes. Uh, I think what we found was uh, we were working with one existing NGO, we were able to identify some underutilized assets, which were in this case the training materials. By trying to find a collaboration with a second NGO, we could identify a capable network. And this network had a range of national operators and they also had uh, connections with the school networks and access also to the uh, education ministries and curriculum. We always understand that teachers have a lot to do, so best to make it match what they they are expected to do by their own education ministries. Uh, we also, through them, managed to access a charitable translation service, the Rosetta Foundation as well, which was able to uh, uh, translate all of the materials in a very efficient way. We brought the elements together and we were able to fund that, so it was very efficient for us, and we were able to provide a connection to our own Toyota network. We were then efficiently sharing the best practices and we had a magnification of impact and this is very much in line with Toyota principles. The integration of the project uh, is now going on into the NGO's own activity so there will be a level of self-sustainability and self-sufficiency for the project going on so we believe that we have actually built capacity in this area. It was a phased project, so we started with the youngest group and that meant that those young children could progress through the programme as, uh, as the programme uh, uh, developed over the five years. And we learned about project communication within the students and the community as well. So what works uh, for, the, for the schools in communicating through social media, through blogs, through activities such as that. But also we learned some hard uh, issues like how to respect the privacy of uh, children, for example, for GDPNR. Our learning points were though that we have to support the development of the project with a common direction, with a terminology and also a KPI. So how to measure how successful we're being, how to share that information. We also had uh, an extended project is needed uh, to build the confidence, the capacity and the resilience. We couldn't expect to do this type of level of project within one year. So we needed to have a slightly medium to long-term approach. And the localization of uh, certain content was also required. So the plants that grow naturally in the UK, for example, are very different to the uh, plants that would grow naturally within the area such as uh, um, Turkey, for example. So we needed to choose uh, certain signature speech, species of plants to look at uh, within each of the uh, uh, local companies. So the uh, next slide, please. I think that is my last slide. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and I would like to hand over to Balash.
Palash, you're also still on mute. Yeah, thank you, sorry. So I just said thank you to Steve and I'd like to uh, introduce our organization and give you an insight of a project of ours, uh, which is uh, about uh, sustainability. So uh, this is, I represent Anthrop Anthropolis. Uh, next slide, please. Can you hear me clear? Because I just got a message that this is noisy, that my mic is noisy. Can you hear me clear? Okay. So, uh, yeah. So we are a Hungarian NGO. We started to work uh, on this area in 2010, uh, 2002, so almost 18 years now, uh, working on the field of education. Our main goal is to embed the global perspective into all levels and forms of education, meaning formal and non-formal education, and all levels means from uh, kindergarten to university. We have projects with, uh, with uh, kindergartens, and also we gave lectures at universities. Uh, we are supported mainly by EU funds, so there's an entry point for uh, uh, companies, for the business sector, if you find it interesting. What we do, next slide, please. So what we do, we created a resource hub for, for resources, because in Hungary, there's a lack of uh, resources on, on global learning or, or global education. So we try to uh, solve this problem with our small resource hub, which is in a uh, university in Budapest. We, we also, we not just uh, uh, established that resource hub, but we also feed it with resources created by us. So we, uh, we produce uh, educational materials, uh, toolkits for teachers, and uh, for students as well, and uh, any other materials which support, which support uh, uh, education. So not just uh, uh, books, but also games, for example, or maps or whatever, uh, which can support uh, an educational activity. We also uh, deliver campaigns for the public, for the wider public, as well, and we do actual teaching activities like uh, delivering workshops for teachers and schools and so on. Next slide, please. So I'd like to give you an insight of a particular project of ours, which is called Global Issues, Global Subjects. It's an international project. It's a partnership of nine NGOs from Europe, which are uh, uh, the Great Britain, the Czech Republic, France, Poland, Italy, Austria, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Hungary. We have uh, approximately seven, eight uh, projects uh, in parallel, and not, it's not so common to have so many uh, partners. Normally we have uh, five, six par five, six partners in a project. This time, nine is quite, uh, uh, means that it's quite a big consortium uh, working on how to, how to support schools with uh, uh, educational materials and activities uh, and how to introduce the global perspective uh, uh, into formal education. On the picture, you can see the happy teachers who who were uh, involved in a in a training in Slovakia uh, from from all the all the countries all the uh, partner countries next slide please so the the aim of this project as i mentioned is to embed the global uh, issues into formal education or vehicle was the the sdgs so we, that was the framework, and we were targeting teachers and pupils 
uh, with different activities you are going to see on the next slide a bit more of these activities so what we did and we still do in uh, in this project is uh, uh, directly working with with students uh, which is a fun a lot of fun to work with uh, with uh, pupils but it's it's of course less effective so next slide please so we uh, we build on a ripple effect so we are also targeting not just directly students and schools but also teachers so we created a blended learning uh in the frame of this project a, a blended learning uh, training for teachers uh, in hungary so this is the the hungarian uh, uh, course blended learning course they had like almost 30 teachers work with us uh, for over two months and uh, learned about the background of global learning and global education but at the at the contact meeting we also offer them uh, tangible knowledge on how to how to uh, use their their gained knowledge in their everyday practice next slide please we also uh, delivered the school campaign and involved uh, schools uh, all over Europe in the partner countries, but we were focusing on Hungary. So uh, uh, students had to uh, create their own creative campaigns around the SDGs. And on the slide, on, the, on this picture, you can see the the winner uh, uh, winner schools uh, campaign. Next slide, please. Uh, a, a bigger part of the work was to create a toolkit for, uh, for teachers. I'm not sure if you can see, see this, probably I'm pretty small in your, in your screen, but this is to show you that we created these books and they are quite quite heavy actually so it was a lot of work uh, these are uh, targeting teachers and uh, we choose three subjects which are mathematics geography and uh, Hungarian literature and uh, these books are filled with with uh, 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 classroom activities on how to embed uh, the global perspective into everyday everyday teaching practice of different uh, subjects teachers of different subjects next slide please and we also have to think about uh, promotion promoting our activities so we we were organizing round tables before the covid we didn't have to have these uh, roundtables uh, virtually, but we could have uh, uh, actual meeting uh, meetings with uh, with teachers and other people who are interested in our work. So we we also uh, uh, focus on how to promote uh, our activities on a wider scale to uh, help people understand not just teachers not just just students but the wider public what uh, global learning means uh, uh, in what way is it different from just about being green or think think about uh, environmental issues i think it's an important uh, uh, topic uh, for us but I think we are going to have a chance to talk about it later in the uh, uh, plenary uh, discussion, how we think uh, what is important in the society in general and in education, if we're talking about uh, sustainability. 
next slide. I think that's all from me. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I am, uh, just as the others are open to questions. Thank you very much, Balaj. That was very interesting. Thank you, all the other speakers, for your uh, fantastic presentations. Uh, we've got a few questions. Um, I think uh, one one question is around the relationship between businesses and NGOs. Um, so, what um, what is the advantage of using an NGO collaboration over doing a project all by yourself? And on the other side of it, which I think is more directed at the NGOs, you know what. Um, support do NGOs need from the business sector and what can NGOs offer the business sector? So maybe um, we can start with the question around, um, you know, NGO collaboration with companies. Uh, Steve, would you have a view on that? Um, I'd like to talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, um, I think the the first thing I would say is one about competence um, in terms of working with an NGO, we are already working with some competent people. So in the case I mentioned, the scientific competence about the development of the training materials rested with Kew uh, uh, Gardens. Um, <coughs> and actually, we didn't have that competence to develop that training material at all. Uh, so there was one advantage. The second advantage was uh, to work with the second NGO uh, and pulling these together into co collaboration was the, the fact that they had uh, a very established network of uh, national operators. They already had access to schools. They had access uh, to uh, um, uh, a translator, for example, they were used to translating the materials. And also they had very uh, important links with the ministries of uh, education. So they could understand the pressures that uh, were placed upon the teachers and uh, the expectations of the curriculum as well uh, within each country. I think you're muted. Uh. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve, <laughs> for pointing that out and also uh, for your response. Um, over, over to you, Bolaj. You, you, you're talking about what um, NGOs are looking for in working with businesses. So what kind of cooperation, uh, what kind of working relationships are best? And also, you know, what can the NGO offer the, the business in, in, in the joint project? Yes, so uh, thank you. What we can offer is obviously, first of all, our enthusiasm and uh, uh, that we really believe in what we do. And I think it's a great uh, advantage when you try to work on, on, on anything or any issue in general. So what we offer, what we can offer, and I say we can because we never had a chance actually in Hungary uh, working with uh, the business sector. It's, uh, it's a huge uh, uh, challenge for us to find, find the ways uh, of cooperation. But what we could offer is our expertise, as Steve uh, mentioned. So we are experienced in, uh, in, in teaching, in actual teaching, in delivering uh, trainings for adults and for kids as well. Uh, and formal and non-formal sector, uh, so, so both of them. And also we have a, a school network. Over the 18 years, we had a chance to, to build up a quite a, 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 a concrete uh, uh, school network and network of teachers. And I think if, if a company or a biz, uh, the business sector uh, representative is looking for, for uh, activities uh, in in education they need they need uh, this kind of uh, expertise and support what we can offer and uh, uh, on the other hand what i would expect is uh, some financial support would be great of course uh, uh, on 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 different uh, uh, um, activities in projects but in more general, in at least in Hungary, what I really miss is the 
is the openness of the business sector. So in educate, especially on the field of education, uh, I, th I think Steve was talking about, or most of us were talking about numbers. And, and of course, we understand that uh, the effectivity or the, 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 the proof of your work is, is good if you can uh, uh, justify it with numbers. But what we do in education is, is changing attitudes. And it's much more tricky if you want to measure it, what, what attitude change you could, you could uh, uh, reach with your, with your audience. It's, it's less obvious, so it's, le it's less direct, the outcome of our work. And uh, I need some uh, under, uh, understanding from the business sector that it's not so easy to, to turn it into uh, numbers. Thank, thank you, uh, Balash. Um, over to you, Tor. What uh, challenges uh, do you face really working with businesses, and, and you know, how does the relationship work best? Um, what, what, what's your experience? Uh, I mean, uh, in our direct experience relates uh, mainly to working side by side with them in the implementation of projects. Um, us particularly haven't done any one-to-one -one kind of a professional relation, but it's always as part of a consortium. I do think that uh, both uh, entities, the, the, the private one and uh, in this case uh, the non-profit one, can really uh, do collaborative work. Uh, they have different set of expertise. Uh, the, the NGOs themselves uh, tend to have, uh, depending on the character of the NGO, more grassroots uh, potential. I think that the question in the chat uh, came from a, a person who was a part of a group of volunteers, and uh, that is the, the grassroots field. Uh, and the, the, the synergy between a business and and an NGO allows you to, to reach uh, a general audience, I guess, in a more direct way. Uh, pretty much uh, what Balas is mentioning, uh, as ourselves, uh, we are doing it um, in this project specifically that I am coordinating, uh, a lot of uh, synergies with uh, people on the ground, so to speak, to actually try to uh, address several issues. But the private sector, um, tends to have a very specific uh, sector expertise that uh, whether it's uh, in this case of Steve, uh, car manufacturing in Toyota, it's like, it's unparalleled, uh, but how do you drive the, the communication of your uh, environmental, environmental or sustainable uh, advances uh, to the general audience? Uh, it, in that way, I think that the coordination with NGOs uh, can be done easily. I don't see challenges. It relates much more to the very different way of perceiving uh, professional life and urgency in the private sector uh, in comparison to the nonprofit sector. But besides that, I see more opportunities uh, than challenges, uh, truth be told. It's just about properly finding the, the, the synergies and what is common. Okay, thank you, Tor. Um, we, we've got a question for Leone. Um, this, is around, this is from Antonio asking around um, urban regeneration activities and maybe expanding on, on a little bit of what, uh, what you're doing there. Yes, uh, perfect. Um, so I was not directly involved with this uh, project, so I will start off right away. A Antonio, please, you can send me a, a private message uh, th through my account, and I I'm happy to put you in contact with the colleagues who are actually working on this. But to give you a bit more of an idea, so this is the first time that this um, event took place. Like I said, it was in Milan uh, in February, <laughs> right before the pandemic hit, so the last in-person big event that was actually done. Um, it was on two days, over two days. And so it was aimed both at high school students, at university students. And what they did is like I, like I said, it was focused on 
urban um, generation. Um, so, so the idea was, I think, as all of you know, um, don't put me down on these numbers, but it was something like uh, urban areas cover 2% of the earth, but account for 50% of CO2 emissions. So obviously this is something um, we, we should be working on. Um, and so the idea was to get all of these students together um, to understand and maybe also create new ideas um, on how to deal with that. What can you actually do? More and more people are moving to cities. That's not something that will change. So the idea was to figure out what is it that we actually can do. And I think Milan is particularly interesting because I know they already have a few projects in the city. You know, they have these towers that are covered in plans. So what they did is there were a lot of workshops uh, and also big discussions. Um, like I said, there was a lot about what role can technology play. There was a hackathon, um, but it was also about um, innovation, what role can startups play? Um, also, how can you use data, big data? And um, what was also a really big point was how can you actually transfer the knowledge? How can you basically get everyone together, the business side, the academic side, the cities? How can all of these people get together and uh, find solutions to this, um, all these pressing issues? But again, um, I'm happy to put you in touch with my colleagues uh, so you can have a more detailed discussion about this. Wonderful, thank you very very much, Lenny. Uh, we got another question around uh, working with disadvantaged um, youth, uh, people from uh, difficult socioeconomic backgrounds. Maybe that's a question for Bolash to have a go. Uh, yes, we ha we, ha we uh, have experience on that field, but it's it's. Uh, I see the question, but it's just too general, I think, in that way, because uh, uh, in in what way is it uh, interested, Lena, you? Because, yes, of course, we work with uh, disadvantaged youth, especially with, with uh, uh, deprived areas of Hungary. But uh, from our point of view, they are not different from any of the target groups. So we, uh, we, we work with them uh, just as we do with others. Uh, from, from sustainability, uh, uh, from this perspective, uh, I don't see any uh, specialties uh, we need to work with them. So if you, if okay. you have a more specific question, Lina, maybe we can answer that. All right, thank you. I think um, uh, Leonie might have something to contribute on this one with one of her projects. Over yeah. to you, Leonie. Yes, thank you, Bruno. So um, two things. Um, I mentioned this project about um, gender equality in France. Um, so the focus of that is obviously not sustainability in itself, but just encouraging these uh, young women from, let's say, difficult backgrounds um, to just realize what potentials they have. But what I think is really interesting in that respect is I spoke about this um, environmental classes we have in Germany. So um, we, we do them in primary schools uh, close to our um, office in Germany, which is near to Dusseldorf. And um, we, we do it in schools uh, close to Dusseldorf, which are usually very, let's say, rich areas. So um, lot, lots of kids from, from rich families. And our experience is that with them, a lot of them are already really aware of all of these issues. And, and sometimes you really get the feeling we're not actually teaching them anything, anything new. <laughs> um, what we also have is this experience that Steve mentioned is uh, that a lot of them um, are saying, yes, this is so right, but my parents don't listen to me. They still drive me to school in their big car and that's not necessary. So that's uh, also in the, uh, let's say something we have noticed. Um, but on the other hand, we also do this project a bit further up north. Um, so in, in an area that is um, traditionally not as well off as uh, let's say just off. And so our experience there is, is that these classes run differently than the ones we do um, in Desert Off because um, A, just, just the whole atmosphere in the classroom is really different. Um, and um, so sometimes it's um, there's also less to start off on or to base the conversation on. So, so if we talk about recycling, or if the NGO talks about recycling, um, a lot of them, a lot of these pupils don't know this from home. 
So whereas in Dusseldorf they say, yes, of course we sort our waste. For them, it's just like, well, we have one waste bin and we just put everything in there. So um, it's, it's always really interesting to see that you kind of have to, um, let's say, change the lesson a little bit to take into account um, where the children are at and where to get it from. Um, but I, our NGO partner just is, is really well equipped to deal with that. So um, it's always a really interesting lesson. But like I said, it's interesting to see how different the actual lessons are um, in different schools. Thank you, Lenny. Um, okay, we have another question. Um, so do you see the companies that you work with as resources, not only related to funds, but also human resources? So the children of the employees in this way could be used to implement an organizational culture, engagement with the companies and access to, to young people. Over to you, Steve. I think you might be able to contribute here. Yes, uh, a little bit I, I think I can contribute. So um, I think there's two ways, particularly where we have uh, the uh, community immediately around one of our locations. So I spent 15 years at the factory in the UK and we uh, participated in two, two ways, I would suggest. One is using our facilities, so actually providing the opportunity for young people to come into the factory, to have a look around the factory, to understand actually how we make things. We also uh, uh, gave our resources to uh, some competitions as well where the children actually uh, built a solar car, for example, and then they came to race them at our, at our factory. And also, uh, even on the biodiversity front, uh, we have some areas within our factories where uh, a walk can be taken. You can uh, see the insect hotels. You can understand uh, a little bit about the biodiversity. So we can actually use our facilities as well. But also, we can use our people because uh, in both of those, or in those examples I've just mentioned, uh, we're using volunteers as well within those activities uh, on site. Uh, people use some of their own time to make those explanations to those uh, those school children uh, that, that are visiting. Um, <clears throat> but also, um, we, we've uh, participated in other uh, volunteering activities, such as engineering clubs, where actually uh, a member from the uh, uh, organization often and a young graduate uh, um, <clears throat> can go out to act the school participate in an engineering club support them with some projects uh, and, and teach uh, the children a little about uh, engineering other than from a teacher's perspective so we, we, we've done quite a little bit in that area and potentially we would like to uh, uh, expand uh, that opportunity uh, in, in the future uh, uh, as well. Um, we also see this as an advantage also for the people who are working for us. In fact, uh, the, the young people are able to train uh, uh, themselves if you like by doing and sharing uh, with, with with school children and it's possibly a less uh, um, pressured uh, environment for the actual uh, Toyota employee to learn about uh, uh, teaching and getting some uh, leadership um, experience shall we say. Thank you Steve. So we have another question. Um, uh, I'm going to direct this one to Tor. So has COVID had an impact on your projects and activities? Uh, did you find new ways of engaging young people outside of in-person interactions, if that makes sense? Uh, yes, I mean, um, it has obviously had an impact uh, in the projects and activities uh, for us and for everyone around the globe. Uh, uh, it has been about uh, adaptation to the reality um, regarding engaging uh, young people. For instance, in, in my project, uh, we were meant to have uh, throughout the summer wilderness camps. Uh, and in some countries, we had to cancel them or postpone them uh, for next year uh, because it was impossible to, to make them out. In some cases uh, where the sanitary conditions allowed it to, uh, we still implemented the wilderness camps, uh, but instead of having a wilderness camp in uh, three days uh, with uh, 30, 40 people, we decided to have like, a, you you go to the wild with us uh, for that full day, but not uh, 30, 40 people, but only uh, 10 people separation and such. But obviously those are adaptation issues to engage people uh, 
you you have to go online digital in in these circumstances uh, ourselves in in at c web for biodiversity we started like a bigger campaigns in social media we are usually more a direct project implementation on the field work and policy based in in brussels but it's like okay let's go let, let's go more for twitter and and facebook with intensity to to propagate the the message in a very different way, uh, since we cannot do it on the field as, as usual through our projects. Um, I think that's the, the, the universal approach uh, that has had to happen. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, Balash also wants to say something. Yeah, Balash, what, what, uh, yeah. what would you say to that? Yeah, just quickly. Yes, we were. Uh, uh, affected, of course, as, as all of us uh, by the COVID situation. The first part is that we are not allowed to go into schools, so we cannot deliver uh, direct trainings to students and pupils, which is uh, which is in, in connection to what we think about learning or the learning process, because we don't believe in frontal, frontal teaching. We believe in interactive uh, uh, learning processes. So uh, we had to put some of our activities on, on the virtual uh, uh, to put them online, but it's much more difficult to have it, uh, to make it interactive. Uh, so we, we had to uh, change some activities. What we could do, we, uh, we uh, relocated them from schools to outdoor activities, if it was possible. And what we did also, to uh, deliver online trainings for teachers, which which can be uh, interactive uh, on this uh, media as well, and it was uh, more about uh, uh, critical thinking, which is also part of our activities. And I think every learning process have to have to be a critical thinking part, uh, especially when we when we talk uh, about sustainable sustainability or education for sustainable development critical thinking is a, is a core issue for us so we we deliver trainings for our teachers and build on the ripple effect what we might have through them okay thank you very much uh, for that uh Lenny, you have uh, something to add to this i believe yes thank you um, I just want to add to what Balash said, because this is exactly our problem. I've, I've hinted at that in my presentation, in uh, that especially when we're speaking about younger children, we really also believe on a practical, hands-on approach, because sustainability is really complex. And how do you explain to a five-year-old what sustainability is? Uh, and how, how do you do that virtually? So, so for us, we really haven't found a good alternative to reaching younger children. Um, what we figured out is for um, older students so at the university level, um, what works really well, because we've basically transitioned that from in virtual, from in-person meetings to virtual meetings, is um, joining seminars or, or workshops with, with students and just having a really open discussion about certain sustainability topics. So, so something that we're, we're doing um, in, in Germany at the moment is uh, our European director of uh, sustainability is joining different different classes. For example, he, he joined a, um, a course with an um, with MBA students in, in Belgium just to discuss about the role of business and sustainability. What 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 is company? What are companies' expectations? What are the, the um, expectations of society? And and that is something that works really well. But again, that's at the university level, and they're also really used to this format anyway. Um, but unfortunately, when it comes to younger children, we're still at a loss. So if anyone has a good idea, please feel free to share. Thank you, Leonie. Um, so we have a, we have another question here. Um, this is around um, uh, what's referred to as um, groups, disadvantaged groups receiving corporate philanthropy. So this is um, your experience of working in geographically diverse areas across Europe, um, experiencing the preference for more mainstream target groups in geographical areas, putting more remote regions and regionally disparate, disparate groups such as the Romas at disadvantage. Um, 
Steve, have you got something to say here? Yes, uh, uh, Bruno, I, I, I can mention that we've had, in some senses, uh, rather the opposite uh, experience. So um, we've, by working with a, a, an NGO that is delivering our materials or has the capability of delivering our materials to many uh, countries uh, through their national operator network, um, we actually disassociate ourselves working uh, directly uh, from uh, the region immediately around a factory, for example. So we, we we use their network rather than ours, and then we try to connect our network uh, 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 to the regions that would like to pull the uh, information. So I mentioned earlier that, uh, for example, um, we've we've been working in up to i think it was 14 at the peak countries i think 13 right now um but we don't have any factories in a number of the countries so for example we we got a pull for uh, uh, our activity from estonia latvia from uh, serbia croatia bulgaria uh, italy uh, these were countries oh and slovenia uh, th these were countries actually that we don't have a big uh, well we don't have any manufacturing presence at all and uh, we we try to connect just with our sales and marketing companies in, the, in those areas. So I think by working with the, uh, the, the national operator network of the chosen NGO was a, a significant advantage for us. It allowed us to get a greater reach and allowed the countries that actually wanted to be really engaged in our project to, to, uh, uh, to join the club, as it were. Thank you, Steve. Um, does anyone else have anything to say? Bolaj, would you like to contribute? Uh, sorry, I wanted to contribute to what Leone said before, and it's just uh, under, uh, underline what, what I said, that if, if a company has difficulties, how to address issues to a younger generation, uh, here we are, uh, help you with our, with our expertise, because we, we do know methods how to how to work with them and not uh, uh, yeah we, we we know how to help them uh, uh, look for answers or raise questions because we uh, as I mentioned we are not giving them answers or we're not teaching but we we give them a, a, a hand to 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 uh, have them understand the world around us and it's not just a an age issue because uh, any generation has to raise their questions and and uh, the the olders has difficulties with that as well so yeah we, we can we can support uh, the business sector with our with our methodological uh, uh, expertise Thank you, Balish. This is this is really great. I completely agree. Um, I, my my point was more to right now. I think during the pandemic, it's really hard for us to reach younger children as opposed to, to older ones. But yes, to all you said, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so some more questions. Uh, there's a question around um, to tour actually. Um, you mentioned the recruitment of youth ambassadors. Um, who, who can participate in that and how and what is expected from them? Uh, well, participation for youth ambassador, as, as the term says so, is uh, for the youth uh, within the project. Uh, we consider it anyone between the ages of uh, 16 to 35 makes me feel glad because I am still considered a youth then. Uh, but everyone uh, within the participating countries, uh, these eight countries, uh, Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, Germany, Czech Republic, Lithuania, Lit Latvia, and, uh, and Hungary, of course, where I am located. Uh, can participate. Uh, if you visit uh, the website of uh, the project, I will leave it in the chat box. Uh, you can check the, 
the participating partners from, from each country to be in contact with them, uh, to check their, their own national uh, websites for the project for the recruitment of young ambassadors. And the idea is to uh, work with them, first of all, uh, regarding the, the educational purposes, preparation for them to become uh, young ambassadors. And the idea is uh, for them to be the, the real voice uh, of, of this activation of uh, the further youth around uh, the region. Uh, so it is open to, to anyone that has a predisposition and that would like to become uh, an activist with a voice and obviously with the support uh, of, of the project in any means uh, necessary. Thank you. Um, Tor. Uh, so any um, any further questions, do please um, put them in the chat uh, box. Um, we've got um, we've got one question, I think, around um, the advantages and disadvantages of a centrally run European project versus multiple nationally based projects. Um, Steve, is that something you've got experience of? Yes, for for sure. The um, the project that I explained, uh, we we ran as a centrally run project, and uh, the ideal uh, situation from there was that we we took one set of content, and uh, actually we replicated. It's a it's a word we have in Japanese called yokuten, which means taking a best practice and reutilizing it. Uh, in Europe, we have a special case because we have to translate that material into uh, into different national languages. Whereas some of the other regions of the world, there uh, like Americas, for example, uh, uh, or North America at least, is just they can spread the uh, information much more easily across the country um, uh, also uh, um, we realized that uh, we could spend our effort much more efficiently by doing it this way because actually um, we, we had one uh, organizer working with the uh, um, the two NGOs the one who was supplying the content and the other one that was uh, making uh, uh, the the transmission of that content after the translation uh, so our resources were much more efficient um, and also the uh, a degree of efficiency within our own network as well so for example each country's national operator from our perspective our, our dealer network in that particular country uh, could jump into this project with very little effort so in terms of resource uh, effort and sharing of a best practice where it very quickly it's it's much more efficient to work it as a central project however there is the downside. The downside being is that actually sometimes our uh, uh, distributor may not have the same level of passion uh, to join in that project as the national operator from the uh, NGO side. So uh, sometimes we've had to try and encourage uh, the connection between uh, the national operator from the NGO and our distributor in that particular country. So we have to put the effort in slightly differently. Brilliant, thanks, Steve. Um, so I think a question really to sort of, as we wrap it up now, uh, for everyone um, on the panel, um, so we go around them one by one. So what makes a good NGO business partnership in the field of sustainability education for young people? Uh, would you like to give an answer, Steve, or uh, maybe with, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I can take it first. So I think the uh, the, the very important uh, area is a shared agenda. So uh, we were able to find a shared agenda quite easily with the Foundation for Environmental Education and with uh, Kew Gardens and Toyota. We all wanted to engage uh, the biodiversity topic with uh, young people to try and make advocates, as I mentioned, on that area. And the, the other side was competence. So we had the competence coming from uh, Q on the science. So nobody could doubt the content of our materials uh, and that they were uh, uh, scientifically based and, and therefore good to be used within the schools. That was one level of competence. The level of competence from the Foundation for Edu uh, Environmental Education was their, uh, their uh, distribution network uh, as well. So they had the connections that we needed. So that was the, the key elements for us. Wonderful. Um, 
Tor, would you have any views on this then? I mean, I, I, I cannot but agree with Steve. Uh, the, the shared agenda has to be the base. Um, after that, I would say that obviously, depending on the expertise of uh, the business and the NGO, uh, a proper separation of uh, the, the tasks to be made, the activities to be made. I mean, uh, an NGO can be more in the policy uh, uh, making and uh, development level or in education per se, in the r research, but obviously the, the businesses have their their own set of, of expertise. So the shared agenda is the first thing, but a proper division of what are the capacities of each. As long as we're aiming for the same, there shouldn't be a problem. Um, because in the end, uh, the, the businesses, while they on on the core might be more profit oriented they have these specific areas like related to sustainability or to outreach uh, environmental outreach to people that are very clear on their goal uh, very principle and that's what they want uh, so there there shouldn't be a, a problem on on the common aim and a proper collaborative work it's about the finding out the the the, the expertise from from each one in a way to make it work out Thank you, Tor. Um, Olaj, would you like to add yes, something? Thank you. Uh, if you mean uh, by shared agenda that uh, we have the same understanding what sustainability means, I think it's a good basis. Because in Hungary, in general, sustainability is mainly about uh, environmental issues. But it's for us. It's it's much more than that. It's much more complex, and uh, uh, everybody uh, has to understand that. So it's as I mentioned before. It's not just about uh, 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 environmental issues, but also gender issues, which is a, a topical issue now in Hungary, uh, but and also cr critical thinking. Which is uh, which uh, can be even dangerous for <laughs> for 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 a school or even even a company if you teach uh, people think critically because they might criticize their own work. So it's 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 kind of tricky, I think. But it's important not to use uh, sustainability or education for sustainability just tokenistic. Which is good for the for the PR uh, uh, for a company and uh, but, but real effective committed work uh, on every aspect of, of sustainability. I think this is a good basis for a collaboration. Thank you, uh, Bolaj. Yes, um, it's a difficult uh, situation there. Um, Leoni, would you like to um, wrap us up with a response? Sure. Um, so basically, all my talking points were covered already. So I agree with with all of the previous statements. Uh, one thing I think that is really important for us, um, in addition to having a shared agenda and a shared understanding of what sustainability actually means, like like Wallace said, for us, for example, it's also important that sustainability is not just the environment. Um, but what I think is really important is also to have um, open and clear communication. So uh, the projects I have been involved in, it was always really important that both sides are able to, to make really clear what it is that they want and what it is that they expect um, for, for it um, to work. And I think for us, that maybe also goes back a little bit to the question that Steve answered. Um, our focus is more on many different local projects because we, we feel that at, at this point, um, this is the way to make sure for us that the project is really effective and that is it is um let's say focused on a, on a local need that there is like i like i said and like many of the other said issues might be different in different countries um so yeah maybe maybe to wrap it up uh, i think is really important as always to talk to each other and um, make sure everybody has the same understanding of what we're trying to achieve wonderful thanks Leonie. <laughs> So I think that uh, is uh, brings us really to the end of our 
uh, round table now and I'd like just once again to thank all the speakers, uh, Leone Tor, Steve and Bolaj for all their wonderful contribution. Um, if there's any further information requests, I've just put my email into the chat line. If you need to um, request any more details, please don't hesitate to contact us. And um, thank you very much, everyone, for their participation today. It's been a fascinating uh, uh, conversation and presentations. And uh, everyone, please stay safe and uh, farewell and uh, best of, best of uh, luck.